This episode of Luke's English Podcast is sponsored by Cambly. This is another well-established and reliable service that helps you get that much-needed speaking practice into your weekly life by putting you directly in contact with English teachers from English-speaking countries like the UK, Australia, Canada and the US. With Cambly, you can start having conversations and lessons with native speakers really easily. Everything's done through the free Cambly app. You get video recordings of your lessons, which you can review later. Cambly teachers are very friendly and willing to help you with various needs. And Cambly are offering all of my listeners 10 free minutes of conversation time. And you can just take those 10 minutes without making any reservations. Just sign into Cambly and then within minutes you can jump into a conversation with a native speaker. It's really easy actually. To get the 10 free minutes and to check out the service in general and meet the different teachers there, go to teacherluke.co.uk slash Cambly and use the ambassador code teacherluke at checkout. Okay, teacherluke.co.uk slash Cambly and use the code teacherluke just like my website address. Okay, right. So that's the little promo for Cambly. Let's now get the episode started and here is the jingle. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello there, you're listening to part two of this episode about punctuation. In the last one, I talked generally about the importance of punctuation in various types of writing. I described a book about pronunciation, which has been sent to me for review by a publishing company. And also, I went through a list of punctuation symbols and described them. So you know the names for a lot of the different punctuation marks available to you. In this episode, I'm going to actually teach you various punctuation rules relating to three big punctuation symbols. I say big, they're, they're actually quite small, aren't they, really? Because uh, punctuation, just sometimes they're tiny little dots and squiggles. Anyway, I say big, I mean important and commonly used. So anyway, I'm actually going to talk about how we use apostrophes and how to avoid uh, certain common errors that actually make people's blood boil with apostrophes. And then I'll give you some tips about full stops and commas. I'm also going to finish reviewing that book which I received in the post recently. It's a punctuation guide, and I'll be giving my review of it. It's called punctuation dot 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 question mark. I've been wondering how to pronounce that. I've decided it's pronounced uh, like this, punctuation or punctuation. Hmm? Anyway, I'll be giving my review of the book. Um, Just before recording this, though, I realised that there were some punctuation symbols which I didn't mention in the last episode. I went through a list of punctuation symbols, but there are some things I didn't mention, and I just want to say them now because you might not know the names we use in English for these symbols. These are ones we see on our computer keyboards, and we use them quite a lot for various things like email addresses and stuff like that. So I'm going to start with just the the word underscore, underscore. So we had hyphen or dash before, which is like a horizontal line in the mid position. Uh, Underscore is a horizontal line in the bottom position, right? And sometimes you get those in, in email addresses, don't you? You know, you might get like Luke underscore Thompson at gmail.com, which is not my email address, by the way. Um, I mean, it's someone's email address. I expect I tried to get Luke underscore Thompson at gmail.com when I, tried, when I first got a Gmail account. And obviously it was taken. Uh, anyway, underscore, you see it in email addresses. It's like, you know, a little horizontal line at the bottom position. That's the underscore, we call it. Then you've got the at mark, at mark, which is obviously in email addresses, at gmail.com. But it's called at mark, if you're wondering, like a little A inside a circle. We call it the at mark. Then what about um, the and symbol, the symbol that's used uh, for uh, expressing the word and? And on my keyboard, 
it's above the number seven. It might be different in your country because obviously keyboards have different sort of layouts in different places. But anyway, the the and uh, mark is like a little squiggle. It's a bit like a sort of a, a a snake with a line through it or something, isn't it? Anyway, we call it the ampersand. Ampersand, which I'm assuming I'm I'm saying correctly. Ampersand, yeah, I thought so. Um, ampersand, there you go, that's like the uh, and symbol. Then we've got the symbol hash, which is um, like, let's say, two horizontal lines and then two vertical lines running through it. So it's like a, a bit like a um, noughts and crosses table, hash. And on, on Twitter, of course, on social media, hash is now like a hashtag, isn't it? Uh, but uh, originally it was just hash. And then also star, which is like a little star, uh, also called the asterisk as well. So there you go. Now I've mentioned those. Let's carry on with this episode with my comments about apostrophes, full stops and commas. And then the rest of my review about the book Punctuation by User Design. User Design, that's the name of the publishing company. And just a reminder, you can find a transcript on the page for this episode on my website, so you can read along with me or skim the script later in order to check for any new words. And there are also links for the book and some pictures too. All right, so let's carry on. So I'm going to deal now with uh, the apostrophe and various uses of the apostrophe. Uh, I'm going to talk about full stop versus dot versus point. So I'll talk about what you know the, how we use the full stop, and then also talk about um, just the words point and the words dot and when we use those. And also talk briefly about the comma. Most of my time is going to be spent talking about the apostrophe because I think this is the slightly more complex one. So I've chosen those things because they're really common, and people surprisingly get them wrong quite a lot. Usually it's learners of English who get full stops and commas wrong and errors with apostrophes are common among native speakers. Um, In fact, errors with apostrophes make some people really angry. I'll say more about that in a minute, but it's the sort of thing that uh, English people, just native English speakers, I suppose, certainly people in the UK, tend to get very sort of angry about uh, when they, they they get very angry when they see uh, people using apostrophes wrong. It's the sort of thing that really annoys some people. Um, And it's something that people love to complain about. Um, Anyway, I'll say more about that in a minute. So one thing to say here is that uh, there is a certain amount of disagreement when it comes to punctuation rules. There isn't a single agreed set of rules that everyone follows. Some things, yes, everyone agrees on, more or less. I think this includes certain basics like the rules of full stops and apostrophes. But for many other areas of of punctuation... And that includes, I would say, commas. Uh, There are always little points of disagreement. Like, for example, as I just said, some uses of the comma. The Oxford comma debate comes to mind. I can't go into that now, though. What's the Oxford comma? I can't go into it now, really, because we'd be here all day. But just Google it to get the full story perhaps on the web, on a website like Grammarly. So what you could do, if, if you want to know about the Oxford comma, just Google Oxford comma Grammarly and you'll get an article um, explaining the whole debate about the Oxford comma. It's the sort of thing some people love to debate and talk about. Um, okay, so be aware that there are some differences of opinion when it comes to style and the application of punctuation. The following information, though, is correct as far as I'm concerned. So the apostrophe. This is not just a brilliant album by Frank Zappa. It's also one of the most commonly used bits of punctuation. And this is a big one because people get it wrong all the time, and it has a few different uses. So I'm paraphrasing from the punctuation book here, by the way. I'm paraphrasing from the book here. Paraphrasing means taking information that you find in someone else's work and then putting it into your own words, not copying it word for word. I mean, changing the wording so that it's not the same as before. In fact, paraphrasing really means reading someone's words, understanding them, and then writing the same concepts, but using different wording. 
Anyone writing essays at university should be well aware of the importance of paraphrasing so that you don't commit copyright infringement. This is a major issue these days because it because the internet allows people to copy and paste other people's text so easily, but we shouldn't do it. We shouldn't pass off other people's work as our own. I know there are plenty of universities that are working on ways to seriously crack down on their students just copy and pasting so I'm I'm saying copy and paste as a verb there. So uh, there are many there are plenty of universities that uh, crack down on their students copying and pasting other people's work into their own essays. Having worked at a university here in Paris, I've seen it done lots of times. I mean, students just copy and pasting work. I've seen it lots of times, and I must say, it really annoys me. It's it's always blatantly obvious as well when a student has just copy pasted something they've found off the internet, and I just can't stand it. For me, the main examples um, were when I was at university. I mean, the main examples were when I gave my university students presentation tasks to do. And they literally just memorized a page from Wikipedia and then recited it to the class with absolutely no effort to even care about or think about what they were saying. Some of those Wikipedia presentations were brain melting. So, you know, for example, I give my students a task. Okay, so you've got a, um, you're, you're going to do a presentation about, what would it be? Something quite cool as well, something good. You're going to do a presentation about D-Day, like the D-Day landings in World War II. Obviously, that's a big subject, but it's possible to just do a, give a brief summary in five minutes. That was the task. And what you get is just students just taking Wikipedia and just literally memorizing it and then just going up there and, and just repeating the information like a robot. And uh, it really annoyed me. And it just looks so terrible when people do that. It's okay to take information from somewhere. Just try to absorb it and then put it into your own words. And please, if you ever do a presentation at university or anywhere for that matter, just try to put some enthusiasm into your work, even if you're worried about making errors in English, okay? Just try to be a human being while you're doing it. Try to put some uh, some enthusiasm into it. Okay, sorry, it's a bit of a tangent. And I touched a nerve there in myself, I think. Bad memories of some moments when I felt frustrated during my days of being an English teacher at university. It wasn't all bad. I had some fantastic classes, some very intelligent, interesting students. But sometimes those Wikipedia presentations were really annoying. Anyway, for the record, I'm paraphrasing the main points that are made by the punctuation book here with some other ideas of my own thrown in. So what's the apostrophe? Well, think about the title of my podcast, as I said before, Luke's English Podcast. There's an apostrophe in it. L-U-K-E apostrophe S. And that one shows a possessive. It's my podcast. It's Luke's podcast, right? So what does it look like, Luke? Uh, Can you repeat that question? What does it look like, Luke? What does the apostrophe look like, Luke? Well, It's a little bit like a dot with a tail that hangs in the air just to the right of a letter. In the case of possessives, it's that's just before the letter S at the end. You know, it's for possessives, but also other things. Here's a list of situations when we use apostrophes. Okay, so we use them to express possessives. We use apostrophes with singular and plural nouns to show that one thing possesses another thing. Here are some examples of possessives with singular nouns. In this case, Dave is the singular noun. So I'm using the word Dave, which is obviously a person's name. Um, Okay. Right, so here's an example of um, of some... what, 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 what? Here are some examples of possessives with singular nouns. And Dave is the singular noun we're referring to. So here we go. So if you, if you actually can see this text, you'll be able to actually count the possessives. But every time I'm saying Dave's, Dave's car, that's obviously a uh, possessive uh, S. Okay? I'm going to read the paragraph because I wrote it. Uh, so that is Dave and that is his car just over there. Yes, that car belongs to Dave. That's Dave's car. This, this car is not Dave's car. This is my car. My car is small. 
But Dave's car is really big. Unnecessarily big, some might say. I don't know why he's been driving such a massive car around the city. Now, as you can see, Dave's car has crashed into my car. My car is now completely smashed up and will have to be thrown away at the junkyard. Dave's car, on the other hand, is relatively undamaged. So Dave's car is fine, but mine is completely smashed up. Okay, that's Dave's car. This is my car. These are my hands. And this is Dave's throat. Yes, that's right. I am strangling Dave in my mind. All right, that was really weird, I know. (laughs) Sorry, I got a bit carried away there. Don't worry, folks, it's just an example. I don't have a car, and none of that ever happened. Uh, And anyway, Dave's dead now, so it's fine. Joking, just joking. All right, I got a bit carried away there. Anyway, just kidding. Anyway, you saw lots of examples of the possessive apostrophe being used there. You know this already, right? Yeah, you do. You should do. Anyway, we use an apostrophe to show possession when we're dealing with singular nouns like Dave. Dave is a singular noun. He's also a single man as well, girls, if you're interested in men called Dave who have large cars but can't drive them. Fictional people called Dave. None of that actually happened. Just to be clear for the record. Is there a record? I don't know. Why do we say that? It also works for things too, this possessive apostrophe S plus s it also works for things it's not just people for example the word car okay that car's windscreen is completely smashed whereas this car's windscreen is somehow undamaged okay so that's singular nouns with a apostrophe s to show a possession possessive Uh, what about plural nouns luke that's what you're all thinking but luke what about plural nouns for goodness sake well what if both cars had their windscreens smashed in the accident as you know, plural nouns in English have S at the end. Uh, right? Sometimes it's E-S, depending on the spelling. But anyway, S at the end. One car, two cars. It's worth re- reminding you of that because sometimes people forget. So what if you're talking about the windscreens of two cars? Well, to add possessive S to a plural word, which already has an S at the end, like cars, what do you do? You've got cars and you want to add a a possessive apostrophe S on the end. What do you do? Do you add apostrophe S like with singular nouns? So that would be C-A-R-S apostrophe S. Is that what you would do? Well, no. Nope. You can just add the apostrophe to the end without the final S. So it's C-A-R-S apostrophe. Okay. For example, these cars windscreens are both smashed. When you're pronouncing it, it's not cars's, you know, these cars's windscreens. No, it's just these cars' windscreens. Okay. To be honest, if we're not talking about a person, I'd probably find another way of putting it. I don't think I, I don't often use possessives for things other than people. I mean, you can, you do, we do, but I'd probably find another way of putting it. I would probably say, instead of saying these cars' windscreens are both smashed, I'd probably say the windscreens on these two cars are smashed. Okay? And I might say it like Michael Caine, the windscreens on these two cars are smashed. Whereas Michael Caine would struggle with these cars' windscreens are both smashed. Anyway, actually, it's rare that you have possessive forms of plural names. I think it's quite rare that you have plural names with possessive on the end. It's just weird to say something like Dave's cars crashed into each other, meaning Dave and Dave's cars crashed into each other. It's just weird, isn't it? The point is, for plural nouns, whatever they are, people or things, with possessives, you can just add an apostrophe. Okay? This is also true for names that end in S. Like James, my brother's name, J-A-M-E-S. How do you express, how how do we do apostrophe, uh, how do we do possessives with that name? What if it was James's English podcast? Well, it would be spelt J-A-M-E-S apostrophe. Okay, so for example, you could write James's room, James's room. Uh, um, yeah, James's room. That's J A M E S apostrophe room. I remember that one because when I was a child, 
my brother and I had separate rooms and we had little signs on our doors. My parents put, gave us little signs to show whose room was who, whose. Mine said Luke's room, obviously, with an apostrophe after my name and then an S, Luke's room. James's sign said James's room with an apostrophe and then no S. And I, as a, as a child, I sometimes wondered why they were different. I was like, I used to look at them as a, like a seven-year-old child or something. And in my seven-year-old brain, I'd be like, mine says Luke apostrophe S. His says James apostrophe. Where's the S? What happened to it? Did it, did it fall off? Um, so I sometimes wondered. It's just because James's name ends in an S. So you just do apostrophe. Um, yeah. It's fascinating stuff, this, isn't it? Riveting. For names ending in S like this, you can actually, you can also write James's room. You can do J-A-M-E-S apostrophe S room. You can do it like that too. How do you say that? Well, it's, as I've said, it's James's uh, and that's with apostrophe S or just apostrophe. They're both pronounced James's. Okay. So actually for names, it can be S apostrophe or S apostrophe S. So there you go. That's possessives for singular nouns, plural nouns, and S with names ending in S. But what about irregular nouns? I mean, nouns where the plural form isn't made with an S. Can you think of some irregular nouns where the plural form is like a different spelling? It's not just S. Well, obviously, we've got the word children, one child, two children. And there are others. Well, we just do the same thing as we do with a singular noun in this case. So the for example, the children's toys are in the bedroom. Children apostrophe S. Okay, the children's toys. Other examples of this would be things like women's rights. So obviously it's one woman, singular, plural is two women, women, but uh, you'd say women apostrophe S, so women's rights. The people's champion or the men's changing room. So there you go. If it's a If it's already a plural noun, You just add an apostrophe S like you would do with a singular noun. Okay, now here's a common error with apostrophes. And I'm I'm talking about using apostrophes for plurals. Some people do it, especially some native speakers, but don't do it. This is a mistake that makes some native speakers get really annoyed. Sometimes in the UK, you will see people use apostrophes just for normal plurals, like one pen, two pens, and they're using an apostrophe to show the plural. Oh, my God. (laughs) I don't really mind that much. It doesn't bother me that much. But some people lose their minds about this. For example, you might walk through a market. Okay, you might be walking through a market somewhere, and you might see a sign pointing to some oranges, as if to say, look, you can buy oranges here, like oranges, five for a pound or something. Is that a good price? I don't know. Anyway, you might walk through a market and see a sign for oranges and it's spelt O-R-A-N-G-E apostrophe S. <gasps> that's, not, that's not the correct use of an apostrophe. Or burgers. And it would be B-U-R-G-E-R apostrophe S. Or even fish and chips. Spell F-I-S-H and C-H-I-P apostrophe S. <gasps> <coughs> Needless to say, there definitely shouldn't be an apostrophe in those words. They're just plurals of countable nouns. They're not possessives and they're not contractions of verbs. So no apostrophe there. Those kinds of errors are likely to make people's blood boil. If they know you're a non-native speaker of English, that will make it a bit better. If you do make that mistake, which I don't think you will, because it's not something I see uh, my learners of English doing, Learners of English seem to be okay with that. It seems to be just the native English speakers who do that one. So anyway, if you do that, uh, and if people know that you're a non-native speaker of English, that will make it a bit better. And don't worry, people generally are a lot more tolerant of errors made by learners of English, or if they know it's your second language, they'll be more tolerant. Whereas if if it's you know someone if it's a native English speaker uh, who's made the mistake, then people generally are a bit more judgmental about it. Um, so. Still, don't make these the sorts of mistakes that native speakers make, even if native level English is what you're looking for. So we'll look at a couple of other common errors in a minute. Let me go on to 
just mention apostrophes in contractions to indicate missing letters. Okay, so apostrophes are also used to let us know that some letters have been removed to make contracted forms. To let us know that letters have been removed. Let us know letters. All we need now is some in some salad lettuce in this sentence and we've got something potentially confusing. Let us know if the letters have been removed from the lettuce. Like imagine a, you, you, you had some magnetic letters like you have on the fridge and they accidentally fell into a, a salad among all the lettuce in the salad and then it caused a problem and then, you know, someone said, just let us know when the letters have been removed from the lettuce and the person's like, I've got no idea what you're talking about. Letters, lettuce, let us. Oh, sometimes language is just too, there's oh, too many possibilities for bad jokes. Anyway, apostrophes are also used to let us know that some letters have been removed to make contracted forms. There's no lettuce or salad involved in this. So, for example, uh, don't, that's D-O-N apostrophe T, obviously, is do not. And the apostrophe shows us that some of those letters have been removed in the contraction. Doesn't is does not. I'll, I apostrophe L-L, is obviously, the apostrophe there just shows that the W and the I have been taken away, right? Isn't, is for is not. Let's, for let us. Let's go to the park, shall we? Let us go to the park. There's is a contraction of there is. Your, that's you apostrophe R-E, not y, you apostrophe R-E, yeah. Not Y-O-U-R, which is a possessive, but your meaning you are, although they sound the same. You are uh, confusing everyone. You're confusing everyone, Luke, and your explanations are a bit confusing, potentially. They sound the same, but different. Okay, so the book says that contracted forms are used for writing out speech. Um, that we, when do we use contractions in writing? Well, according to the book, it says when we uh, are writing out speech, which is a good way of putting it. I would add that these days we, use, we just use contracted forms in any kind of informal and neutral writing, but not in formal writing. This use of apostrophes isn't very complicated, is it? But it does cause one particular problem which is its versus its. That's the difference between the contracted form of it is and the possessive form of the pronoun it. The possessive pronoun its, okay? So, more common errors. Its with an apostrophe versus its with no apostrophe. This is another thing that native speakers get wrong quite a lot. Think of these two examples, okay? Which ones should contain an apostrophe and which shouldn't? Now, obviously, if you're reading the script for this episode, then you'll be able to see the apostrophe with your eyes because it's right there. But for those of you who are listening, in which sentence would you add an apostrophe after it? Okay, so the first one is, it's a lovely day today. And the second one is, my phone has a crack on its screen. My phone has a crack on its screen. Actually, I feel like I should join those sentences together to make one slightly sad sentence. It's a lovely day today, but my phone has a crack on its screen. Mm. So anyway, with an apostrophe, it's means it is or it has, like in present perfect. It's with an apostrophe, it's it is or it has. Without an apostrophe, it's a possessive pronoun. Just like my, your, our, their, his, her. Like my phone, your phone, our phone. Our phones, their phones, his phone, her phone. Okay, none of them have apostrophes either. It's like, uh, for example, uh, possessive pronoun it's would be, we saw a lion, you know, the big cat. We saw a lion and its paw was injured. A paw is a lion's hand or foot. Do lions have hands? No, they just have paws. Exactly. Um, We saw a lion and its paw was injured. That's a possessive pronoun, its paw, the lion's paw, his paw, her paw, or its paw, okay? And then another one would be, oh no, it's injured, it's paw. So it's injured, that's it has, so there is an apostrophe. 
it's injured or it has injured its poor. So for the it's poor, that's the possessive pronoun. So no apostrophe. Oh, sexy, sexy language here, Luke. Sexy language, sexy subject. Is it? I, I, was that sarcasm? For some of you, it's not. Some of you are like, oh, I'm loving this. I love the punctuation talk. Some of you are thinking, can you talk about Marvel's Avengers Endgame, please? Well, yeah, I can, and I will soon. That's an episode coming soon. You'll hear me rambling with a friend of mine all about uh, Avengers Endgame and Iron Man and Thanos and all that stuff. That's an episode coming soon. Anyway, Let me move on to the next bit of punctuation I would like to talk about, and that is the full stop, which is also called the period in uh, American English. This one is really simple, but it needs to be said because I'm surprised at how often I see missing full stops in students' writing, and also people using commas instead of full stops incorrectly. So that does happen. So I'm just going to say, put a full stop at the end of your sentence and a capital letter at the beginning of the sentence. Okay. Now, you don't need a full stop if you have an exclamation mark or a question mark, obviously. Um, How do you know if when it's a full stop and when it's not a comma? Well, if you're using a new subject in a new clause without a conjunction to connect them, then you need a full stop. For example, I love cheese, but I can't eat too much of it because I get sick right? I love cheese, comma, but I can't eat too much of it. So because you've got the word but, that connects the two clauses together. I love cheese, I can't eat too much of it. You see? So that's when you could use a comma. Uh, But in this example, I love cheese, I can't eat too much of it. In that example, you need a full stop between them because there's no linking word to connect the two clauses together. That's a very basic example, but there it is. And and, I mean, that that example, you can make more complex sentences, but ultimately, if there is no linking word to connect clauses together, then uh, you need a full stop between them. All right. Full stop is a phrase that we use in spoken English also to mean, and that's the end of it. I'm not discussing it anymore. Have you ever heard that? For example, You can have the sentence, for example, I don't want to see any more smoking in front of the building, full stop. As if to say, that's it, I'm not discussing it anymore. Okay, so that's the end of the matter, full stop. No more smoking, full stop. In American English, they would say period. And I always think of, you always hear that in movies and TV shows and things. Like, God damn it, John, you're a goddamn maverick. I want your badge and your gun. You're off this case, period. You're off this case, John, period, meaning that's it. And I'm not discussing it any further. So full stop, period. So full stop is the phrase is the, is the phrase or word that we use for the dot at the end of the sentence. All right. That's the little dot at the end of the sentence, full stop. But we also have other little dots in things like numbers and web addresses. So what do we call them? Well, we'll start with the word. Well, it's either going to be dot or point. We'll start with dot. We use this in email addresses and websites. For example, teacherluke.co.uk. Okay, email addresses and websites. Also, we use the word dot just to describe that little shape. A a small round mark is a dot, like on a patterned dress. For example, you might have a blue dress with white dots on it. So we use the word dot to, to describe those shapes. Also, we use the word dot For the top part of the letter I or J, so it's important that you dot your I's, for example, put a dot on on an I if it's a lowercase I or J, and also to describe exclamation marks or question marks. Exclamation marks are a little line with a dot at the bottom. Question mark is a little, little squiggle with a dot at the bottom. So a dot is just the word we use for a tiny, a little, uh, a, a, a tiny round mark, a dot. Then we've got the word point. And this is for numbers, meaning decimal point. For example, 3.14159, which, as you know, is pi. Okay, 3.14159. And it goes on, as you know, pi just goes on and on and on. But anyway, 3.14. Another example, this is from a BBC News headline. Women have 1.9 children on average in the UK. And it's a record low. So the birth rate is, is, uh, is, is low uh, compared to uh, previous years in the UK. So uh, the, the average children uh, that women give birth to 
these days is 1.9. How can you give birth to 1.9 children? I don't know. But yeah, obviously, it's just an average, Luke. Don't, don't try and make a joke. Okay. 1.9 children. There you go. So if it's a decimal point, it's 1.9. And in English, we use a point, a dot for our decimal points. In some languages, it's a comma, which confuses me. But anyway, we actually use a dot or a, a you know a decimal point for our um, for our decimal points. Okay, and then let's let's move on to the word comma. The comma is the most common punctuation mark in English. Basically, comma it's used to make your writing clearer and to indicate some sort of pause in the rhythm of the sentence. We use them to separate items in a list. For example, for example, give me your clothes, your boots, your cigarettes your Pokemon cards, and your motorcycle, which is obviously Arnold Schwarzenegger from Terminator. I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. (laughs) Give me your clothes, your boots, your cigarettes, and your Pokemon cards, and your motorcycle. (laughs) I'd love to see an Arnold Schwarzenegger film, a Terminator film, where he's collecting Pokemon cards. You know, dun, 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 dun. that's when I realized that the monster would stop at nothing until he collected all of the Pokemon cards. I need your, I need your, I need your Squirtle. I need your Pikachu. And I need your, what's the, Newtle. Uh, so, comma is also used when there's a change in the subject in your sentence. That's something the punctuation book said, and I think it's really good. For example, I wanted to watch the new Avengers film, but Dave crashed into my car, so I couldn't. So it's uh, there you see the subject changes. So the first clause is I is the subject. I wanted to watch the new Avengers film. And then we've got comma, but Dave, so this is a new subject for a new clause. Dave crashed into my car comma, because the subject changes again, so I couldn't. You see, so whenever the subject changes, we use a comma. All right, especially when, and obviously you need those, um, you need those linking words like but and so. Otherwise, you would have to be full stops. I wanted to watch the new Avengers film, dot. Dave crashed into my car, dot. I couldn't. And what kind of sentence is that? What kind of collection of sentences is that? Now, obviously, it's better to, to make them all one sentence. I wanted to watch the new Avengers film, comma, but Dave crashed into my car, comma, so I couldn't. All right. Um, there are more little uses of the comma, like the way they're used in non-defining relative clauses or conditional sentences. But to be honest, I can't go into all those things now. You'll just have to get a punctuation guide to get all the details. All right, then. So, This stuff about punctuation can be hard to keep in your head, even when you already know it. That's why you need a reference book to keep going back to. Explaining punctuation is not that easy, especially in an audio podcast. So why not use a book like the one I'm talking about, Punctuation by User Design, um, to save you the effort of working it all out for yourself or doing loads of Google searches and attempting to find consistent answers from different sources. Just buy a punctuation book. One thing I will say again is that there is some disagreement about the rules of punctuation and to some extent some of the application of punctuation symbols in your writing is a question of personal style and personal choice but some things are definitely right or wrong. So the more you know, the more you more control you'll have and ultimately the better it will be for your English. So let me just um, finish up here by just giving my closing remarks about this book. Just finish off my book review uh, of the book I'm, I'm talking about. So there are a few books that explain punctuation that already exist on the market, but not that many. There, there aren't that many that only deal with punctuation on its own. Most of the time, you'll find punctuation reference uh, you, you'll find punctuation guides inside other reference books, like dictionaries. For example, the Oxford English Dictionary probably has pages inside that deal with punctuation, or inside grammar guides, like the Oxford A to Z of grammar and punctuation. So most most of the time, punctuation guides are contained within other reference books. As far as I can tell, the main book people buy when searching for a punctuation guide is the Penguin Guide to Punctuation. So those things are 
you know, the Oxford A to Z of grammar and punctuation, the Oxford English Dictionary, the Penguin Guide to Punctuation. Those things are the mainstream well-known guides. This book, punctuation, dot, 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 question mark, should be considered as an alternative. Okay. Um, So let's think again. Let's think about this book again. Remember how I described it to you earlier? Well, let's go a bit deeper and I'll give you my thoughts, both the negatives and the positives. I definitely like this book, but I think it's not 100% perfect. Um, I mean, nothing is 100% perfect, is it? Let's start with the negatives first. This is where I do some nitpicking. Nitpicking means making small criticisms or critical observations about something. Small criticisms that aren't really all that important. Well, perhaps some of the criticisms are important, but we'll see. But we're going to start with a few negatives. So the design aesthetic of this book is minimal, but It's a bit too minimal in places, maybe. Um, I'm adding maybe to make that sound a bit less strong. So it doesn't always give full reasons for some punctuation points. And it feels like some things are lacking. For example, the page about colons. I had other questions which weren't answered. Like, for example, but shouldn't we put a capital letter after a colon? And if we don't, why not? Because in a colon... Uh, and when do we use a capital letter after a colon and when do we not because i'm sure i've read that rule that you should have a capital letter after a colon and that you can have a colon and then a like a full sentence with a capital letter at the beginning can't you or can't you so those are questions which might be answered by more thorough and detailed punctuation guides or just by googling it i sometimes feel there's There's more to add to this book, and I expect that in the later editions of the book, if they publish them, um, there will be more details added, or at least I think there probably should be, without spoiling the minimal style of the the whole book anyway. So yes, the book feels a little bit insubstantial, as if it needs a bit more. For example, I could do with some pages of commentary, generally, about punctuation in general. Like, it could do with an introduction, or maybe a sort of concluding chapter, even if it's just a page or two. The book covers each punctuation point succinctly and then it just ends. So like the last page, the last page is is about uh, semicolons and that's it. I, I just I just need closure. I just want some comments at the end or something. Um, maybe that's just me. I mean, after all, this is supposed to be just a short and simple guide. So maybe you don't need commentary, but I just feel like it would round things off if we just had like a little paragraph at the beginning and the end but maybe not maybe that's not necessary Um, I would like some comments perhaps from the authors just explaining their process or perhaps giving some opinions about punctuation and style or something like that but I suppose that's the point of this book that it doesn't have all that superfluous stuff at first I thought that this feeling of there's something missing first I thought that feeling um was because of the minimal design with plenty of white space on the page. I, maybe I just thought it, it looked uh, insubstantial rather than actually being insubstantial, if you see what I mean. Um, uh, so, yeah, may, I thought that was because of the minimal design with plenty of white space on the page and the cartoons, which look quite sketchy, even if they are good fun. I thought it was just the effect of the design. But in all honesty, it's not just the way it looks. It's also... Oh, I feel like I'm being too harsh, but I'm saying it's also the content. Don't get me wrong. The pages which are there are great and will definitely teach you good information about punctuation. But it's not really a full book. It's more like a pamphlet. It's even held together with two staples. So it's kind of thin. It's like a pamphlet, which is actually how it's described on Amazon. The recommended retail price on the back of the book is £10, which is higher than the other more substantial books on punctuation which are available. I think that might be a bit of a sticking point for some customers. You would expect the price to be a bit lower, maybe, for the amount of content that you're getting. Also, some of the examples are a bit weird, which can make them slightly confusing. Like they have the example of the snake's hisses to represent um, a plural noun with a possessive. But I suppose it's kind of difficult to give examples of this specific punctuation without coming out with weird examples. I mean, what did I have earlier? Dave's cars crashed, you know, the Dave's wind, the cars windscreens and stuff like that. It's very hard to avoid slightly weird examples. 
But anyway, also, sometimes it's not completely obvious to me what the connection is between the illustration and the punctuation point being explained. This makes it feel a bit like the pictures aren't all that helpful beyond just creating a fun atmosphere. But is that what people want when using a punctuation reference guide? I mean, by all means, use humour and fun. Of course, I, of all people, believe in that strongly. I think it's really important to help people to enjoy learning stuff like this. But I also think that the fun stuff should be performing a function too. And in this case, some of the pictures don't seem to make things clearer. Some of them just seem a bit odd. I can't help feeling I'm being a bit harsh here, especially when I consider the fact that I've been doing stuff on punctuation and arguably I've gone too far in the other direction like I, I I give far too much information and it's all there's too there's a lot of superfluous stuff whereas the book is like the direct opposite of, of my approach this book is like so minimal it's actually refreshing I'm coming out in favor of the book on balance but anyway I'm still talking about the negatives um, so where was I uh, so I was talking about it's important to to um to to have fun but sometimes it feels like the pictures just are a little bit odd but they're idiosyncratic you know which is cool but it's not always that helpful and they might just make the guide somehow less serious which i think is something people look for in a guide like this am i repeating myself here probably i mean this book is is really it's after my own heart, which is a way of saying that it, it comes from the same place that I do, in a sense, that it's all about using a more light-hearted approach to teaching language points. So I've just mentioned those as critical things, but I only think they're critical from other people's points of view. I'd say this is more of an alternative book rather than a mainstream book then. So in summary, it might lack the seriousness and full commentary that some people expect from this kind of book at this kind of price even though I like it. Let me go into the positives. One of the good things about this book is that it's just a nice product to own. It's a nice thing to have. The paper it's printed on is nice and thick and feels pleasant to touch. It has a pleasant looking minimal design, as I've said. The illustrations are quite fun and give the book more personality than your average dictionary or style guide. Also, it would be more appropriate for for young people, I guess, or people who just want a bit more fun. It's quite a good coffee table book, which makes it sound frivolous, but it's the sort of book that you can enjoy flicking through, picking up some tidbits about punctuation that you might have always wondered about. The explanations are short enough for you to digest quite easily. For example, there's there's pretty much one rule or language point or punctuation point per page. Punctuation rules can get pretty complicated, but this book does a a good job of reducing superfluous information. It gets straight to the point and as a result is very useful. Um, I said before that the book could do with some more commentary, like perhaps an introduction or conclusion. But on the other hand, this book's minimal approach makes it very accessible. You'll definitely learn things about uh, pronunciation. Hmm punctuation I think you mean Luke you'll definitely learn things about punctuation by reading this book sometimes very detailed language reference books become impenetrable because there's so much information to sift through like uh, where's the information I need not with this book they keep it short and simple because it's quite fun and a bit different while also being useful I think it would be a good gift you might not choose it in the bookshop if you want a no-nonsense language reference book, but you'd probably be happy to receive it as a present. I actually really like the book, and I'm glad I have a copy. I learned a thing or two from reading it, and it's good to see some originality in this kind of reference work. I should also say that I've mentioned the sort of fun cartoons, but the way it's written is very succinct, and it's very serious as well, in, in, in a sense. It's good. Uh, but it depends on the person, I think. Some people might like this book because they will f- think it's a case of less is more in a positive way. I mean, some people will like the minimal style and will find the illustrations fun and will appreciate a more a more light-hearted feel. But there are bound to be others who would just like more information presented more seriously, please. On the whole, I like the book. Uh, it's original and quirky while also being useful and clear. 
It might not be the serious reference book that some people are looking for, but the information inside can definitely help you understand and improve your use of punctuation. And ultimately, that's the main thing. What did my wife think? Well, this morning I was having breakfast with my wife and the book was lying on the table. And I I sort of pushed the book towards my wife and I said, what do you think of this book? Just give me your first impressions. And she said, well, I really like the pictures. I love this sort of thing. It looks really useful. So there you go. That was her. (laughs) That is her much more brief and succinct review than mine, much briefer than mine. So basically, we agreed that it was a really cool book. So if you're looking for an alternative book about punctuation, which has a more fun approach, get this book, either for you or as a gift for someone else. I think it's particularly good as a gift for someone with a bit of a sense of humour, who is curious about punctuation, and and who also wants to be able to write more clearly. The book seems to be available from all good bookshops, including the main online retailers, certainly the ones which are well known in the UK. Waterstones, uh, Amazon online, and, you know, all the usual big bookshops. So, punctuation, punctuation on the user design website. Have a look. Uh, You'll find the link on the page for this episode. It includes all the relevant information, uh, the title of the book, the, the the ISBN number and all that stuff and, and how to get it. So if you're interested, you can get it uh, at the user design illustration and typesetting.com book or just search for, I guess you can just Google punk, I'm going to try this, punk a tie on uh, dot 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 quest, no dot dot question mark. What happens? Well, we get the dic- de- dictionary definition of punctuation. No, we need punctuation dot dot question and then user design in the search criteria in the search bar, and then we get the uh, the page uh, on the user design website and also on Amazon. Uh, so that there you go. Just Google punctuation dot dot question mark user design and you should find it. Or just click the link on the page for this episode. So I would I would just like to say thanks to User Design for sending me the book. And thanks to everyone out there for listening to all of this. I really hope that you've A, learned some stuff about punctuation. That B, you've, you know, you've followed all of this. Um, because it got a little bit rambly at times, as usual. Um, so, you know, well done for listening all the way to the end. Owning a book on punctuation is a great idea. Uh, If you actually use it, you will see a definite improvement in your awareness of punctuation, which feeds into an overall sense of how you need to be clear when communicating, particularly in your writing. So I do recommend getting a punctuation reference book, either this one for the reasons I've given or another one if this book isn't your cup of tea. And there we go. That's the end of the episode. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I've... You might have seen that I've uploaded five, very recently I uploaded five parts of a premium episode all about present perfect and I go into all the details of how that tense works, all the common mistakes people tend to make with it. Uh, I compare it to past simple, present perfect, simple and continuous and also other verb tenses like past perfect and present tenses and stuff. It's a whole big grammar review of verb tenses focusing on present perfect and if you're interested in that, check it out. Uh, become a premium Lepster. Go to teacherluke.co.uk slash premium uh, where you can sign up. It's basically the cost of a like a coffee or a beer uh, every month. It's it's a it's a I think it's a competitive price, and you get all that extra content plus PDF worksheets that you can download uh, from my website teacherluke.co.uk slash premium. And there are loads of episodes now in the premium archive. It's good. It's going well. It's building. It's building all the time. And uh, hopefully it's becoming more and more of an attractive prospect for you to join up uh, Join up to. I've got quite a lot of people on board now. If you're a premium Lepster, then, you know, props to you. Um, big up your chest, which is a sort of big up your chest. That's the sort of a thing that drum and bass MCs used to say. Uh, okay, I'm going to quit while I'm ahead, if I'm still ahead uh, at this point, and just say thank you for listening. Um, lots of episodes coming. Um, it's a very busy time for me with stuff going on. I'm not going to go into all the details, but basically I'm I'm, I'm going to push out, I'm going to publish quite a lot of content quite quickly over the next probably week or so. Um, 
So there you go. And then I'm going to be going on holiday for a little bit. So it'll give you time to absorb and digest all of the content that comes out. Thanks for listening. Speak to you again on the podcast soon. But for now, goodbye. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.